Thank you, Congressman. Yeah, thanks. I fucking want to figure it out. All right. here, so I'll say a few words. Say a few words. Okay. okay. Get your gong out if I talk too long. Right? That's fine. Darn. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just uh, appreciate the chance to be here. I, we all come to CPAC every year because it's it's the epicenter for conservatives and it energizes us so much. And you know, from uh, the history for me is at a just tell you a little bit of the, the narrative about how I got engaged in the, in the English issue, and it is, you know, I long believed that English should be the official language, and as a candidate for state senate uh, back in 96, we had a fundraiser in a shelter house out in a park outside of Denison, Iowa, had about 150 people there, which is a pretty good turnout for a state senate deal, and, because uh, the governor was there, not because I was there, and uh, anyway, I was standing there giving a speech, ranging across all the subject matter that I thought I should talk about, and uh, one of the things that I mentioned was, I said, I think English should be the official language of the state of Iowa. And it brought out this huge roar and this standing ovation. And uh, I had touched a nerve that was far more raw than I had anticipated. But, and that even would not probably have activated me as much as it has, except the newspaper uh, reporter was in there and he wrote an editorial disparaging me for such a bigoted position. And uh, so you can take a couple of positions on that. You know, you can either curl up in a fetal position or you fight back. And um, so I fought back, and they attacked me in the paper twice a week, all the way through the election and after. And uh, this is a good idea. You know, uh, when you see people resist, then, and, they, and they're vocal, vigorous resistors to the idea that the United States of America should have an official language, well, they go out and demonstrate and jump up and down and beat the drum and call us all kinds of names, and why? Why is anybody so offended by an official language in the United States of America? Why do they get so angry? And my sense then was more an instinct because they were, they were yelling and demonstrating. And uh, I remember my father had told me years ago that, you know, if you go throw a rock into the pig pen, the one that squeals is the one you hit. And so they were squealing. And uh, I decided this must be the right thing. And so I began to drive it, and we uh, over it took six years in the Iowa Senate to establish English as the official language of the state of Iowa. An interesting piece about this was that um, then the Governor Tom Vilsack didn't want to sign this bill, but it was an 84 percent issue in Iowa, and if he wanted to continue his political career, he didn't have much choice. And uh, so in uh, 2002, I put the bill on his desk, and as a I chaired the committee and, and organized the bill and put it on his desk and. So his choice was just really only one choice. It's like the Hobson's choice, to sign the bill. So we became, I think, the 28th state out of now 30 states to, that English is the official language. I came here to Congress, and uh, I carried the mantle with me, introduced legislation that you know now as H.R. 997, the official English Language Unity Act, at which, and it's important that we, not only that we pass this legislation, but that we declare English to be, in law, we must declare English to be the official language of the United States of America. And the reason for that is that if you don't, they will make all kinds of excuses and declare, well, a national language, you know, it, it's got to be an official language so that the official functions of government are in English. And then we had the Voting Rights Act that came up uh, that was reauthorized several years ago, four or five years ago. And it imposes multiple language use and when it comes to voting. And it was about all I could do to be able to offer an amendment on the Voting Rights Act to strike the multiple language requirements that are written in there. I went out and got so many signatures on that. And finally, I had to run against the Republican chairman of the Judiciary Committee and other leading conservatives who stood on the floor and said, wrong place, wrong time. We don't need to have this debate now. Well, it's a 25-year reauthorization, so if it wasn't now, it was going to be a quarter of a century later. I don't think we need to wait like that. Um, so here's, here's the things that I, I just I want to arm you with, some, some thoughts on this, and that is that if you look throughout history and try to find the most powerful unifying force any culture or civilization has ever had, the human universal is a common language. A common language binds people together more powerfully than religion, than common ethnicity by race or culture. There's, there's nothing as powerful as a common language to tie people together. If you go back in ancient history, about 245 BC, the first emperor of China, whom I pronounce it Qishai Wang, uh, got to looking at the multiple provinces in China. They, were, they didn't have governing units at that time as we see them, but different areas where they spoke different languages. And they had similar clothing, food, habits, looks, ethnicity, heritage background, but they were divided. 
and he decided that he was going to unify China for the next 10,000 years. And so, he, among other things that he did, such as Qi Shai Wang standardized the width of the ox carts, he created the terracotta guards, he tied together the remnants, the components of what is now the fully connected Great Wall of China, 5,500 miles long, two and a half times longer than our southern border with Mexico, by the way. Don't tell me we can't build a fence down there. We have modern equipment to do this. Um, he did all of those things, and he hired scribes who were directed to write a written script of the Chinese language that, so that everybody was on the same page, literally, everybody on the same page. And when he did that, his purpose was to unify the Chinese people for the next 10,000 years. And he's quarter away along the way, and they've been pretty successful so far, and there's not a sign the Chinese are going to fracture speaking a common language and writing, especially a common language. You can go through history a number of other ways. Uh, and these are just random thoughts on the passing scene. But when the conquistadors came up into what's now Arizona and they encountered the Native Americans, the Zunis, the Hopis, and the Anasazis, they, were, they didn't speak the same language, the, the three different uh, tribes that I've mentioned. They were fractured into their villages. And if you go live in an isolated village, you kind of create your own language. You ever notice a family that speaks in the lingo? You can't quite understand what's going on around their kitchen table? Well, that grows in tribes. And that's why we have so many languages on the planet, because people didn't travel much. They lived in a single place, and languages sprung up out of the usage and utilization. Well, that was true with the Zunis, the Hobies, and the Anazazis. They couldn't compete. They couldn't communicate with each other. And so the, the, the Spanish conquistadors came in, and they divided and conquered. But the mistake that they made was, if you want to call it a mistake, and it, they brought then the Native Americans into the missions to convert them to Christianity, a good thing, but they also taught them Spanish. When they learned the Spanish, it gave them a lingua franca, a common language, a utility of communication, a common form of communications currency. They went back to their villages and they realized, I can talk to my neighbor. Well, why don't we just organize ourselves and throw those Spaniards out? And they did. So then, well, let's see. When God looked down at the Tower of Babel and he said, behold, they are one people. And nothing they, that, let's see. Behold, they are, they are one people. They speak all one language. And nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. And he, he, he had to scramble their success and so he scrambled their tongues, and they went to the corners of the world. And that's the biblical Old Testament version of how we ended up with all these languages. I mean, there's an anthropological explanation, there's a biblical explanation, but there's no one who disagrees that language, a common language, unifies people. And then, the Israelis is another example. Along about the year 1905 or so, they began resurrecting a dead language, Hebrew. And yes, they use Hebrew in prayer, but not in common discussion and not in business. But they began to teach Hebrew into the, to their children. And the reason was because they wanted to form a nation, a nation of Jews that could be bound together by a common language. And it was an historic language for them. It was, a, it was a, an accurate and an appropriate thing for them to do. But I'll just say 1905 to 1948, when the UN, the United States actually was the first nation to recognize a sovereign Israel, bound together with an official language. I think actually it was 1954 when they, when they finally put ink to pen and declared Hebrew to be the official language of Israel. But now look at them. They're bound together. And by the way, on the raid on Entebbe, when they went down there and they hollered at the hostages and the passengers, get down, they did that in Hebrew. The people that got down, most of them got out of the way of the bullets. Those that didn't get down were in the way of the bullets. So it was really handy to have Hebrew that day at the raid on Entebbe. So if it works for Chinese, and it works for Hebrew, and it works for Spanish, you know that English would be the choice of all of those people if they had the choice today. Thirty-some countries in the world, 31 countries, have English as, the, as their official language, at least one of their official languages. Singapore is one of them, 75% Chinese, English the official language. And if you go to school there, you will learn in English. And if you want to learn your mother tongue, you have to be successful in school, then you qualify to study a language other than English. They know because they are, English is the business language for the world. It's the language of the maritime industry, the air traffic controllers, the business of the world. And by the way, for old Steve King to be sitting around that round table in Brussels at the EU that went from 15 countries to 25, to hear, it's one, you know, hear the Germans speaking with a German accent in English, I, I take a little satisfaction in that. 
but I take more satisfaction to hear the French accent <laughs> around the round table <laughs> at the EU in Brussels. English is the official language of the European Union, and it's not the native language of anybody on the other side of the channel, just the British, but it is a language of success, it's a language of politics and negotiation, and it's a language of business, and we have been the most successful country when it comes to assimilating different peoples. And we've done so because we're bound together under this common language. And, by the way, when I asked the Israelis, several of their uh, ministers or ambassadors were over and we had this discussion, and that's why I know this about the history of Hebrew in Israel, I said to them, why did you adopt an official language? And they said, we knew we had to assimilate people from different cultures all around the world, and we looked at the model of success of assimilation that America had established, and we adopted that model of assimilation. We just chose Hebrew because that's our historic language, and you guys have English. So there's no reason for us to back off. There's no reason to think that somehow all the names we get called are accurate. They are not. Uh, any, any nation in the world that doesn't have an official language, yes, many, many nations have a de facto official language, and almost every nation has an official language. We need to move on this. HR 997 has a hundred and some co-sponsors to it. And uh, by the way, I think it's something that we need to get a hearing on in the Judiciary Committee. And if any of you have any leverage to help me out with that, I'd appreciate it. And I'm going to continue to make the case myself. And I think that when you get to an issue that is up in the 80th percentile, and we have an election coming up, and we're talking about the future and the destiny for America, and English should be up on the floor of the House of Representatives for a vote, send that over to the Senate and see what Harry Reid does with that. And if he doesn't do something with it, then send him back to Searchlight and put somebody in there that will. So thank you very much. I just uh, can't say a few words here. I feel better. I hope we get this done. Thank you. Thank you.